The Page Principles were born in the telephone business, but over the years found a home in businesses of every kind. Larry Foster was the first person to lead the Arthur W. Page Society who had not been brought up in the telephone business. In the mid-1950s, Larry left a job as night editor of the Newark News to organize the very first public relations department for Johnson & Johnson. Over the years, he and his successor, Bill Nielsen, and of course the CEOs they worked for, helped make Johnson & Johnson one of the most admired companies in the world. Larry, if you were a CEO hiring a PR counselor, what would you look for? Well, I want someone who has basic intelligence to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I want someone who brings skills that no one else at the table has. Um, I worked for three chairmen at Johnson & Johnson throughout their entire careers, a total of 25 or more years. And uh, I think each of them looked for the same thing. I was passed off from the first to the second to the third, and I managed to survive. But I, they, they wanted um, basic uh, intelligence. They wanted something from me that they couldn't get from the financial guy or the, or the lawyers and so forth. And a lot of that had to do with my knowledge of the press, my sense of public opinion, and what would be in the public interest. And the other quality that, that I brought, um, I became the loyal opposition. How so? What do you mean? Well, I had come out of a city room uh, to help form the first public relations department at Johnson & Johnson. And um, uh, I was young and I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. And I wasn't, if you will, a PR type. I was um, uh, used to expressing myself um, if there was a situation that warranted it. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in becoming the loyal opposition, you were one who was not fearful of the chairman or fearful of expressing your views. Hopefully, and you were right much more often than you were wrong. But you could do that. Uh, with the chairman that I worked for and with. And um, uh, when you get established a reputation as the, having expressed, ready to express the, uh, the loyal opposition, it was expected of you, and at critical meetings, sooner or later they would um, ask that question, okay, now tell us, Foster, why we shouldn't do this. And whose interests were you representing at that point? Well, fundamentally, the interest in the welfare of the company, but also keeping in the back of my mind how the public uh, would respond to such a decision, how the press would respond to such a decision. And um, uh, where I wasn't concerned so much about the business interests that they might be, uh, the bottom line on a given situation, if I felt that the decision should go another way, um, I wasn't afraid to express it. And I think it was that lack of fear um, of disagreeing respectfully with them that um, establishes one's reputation. And if you're right, uh, more often, hopefully a lot more often than you're wrong, um, it, it was a, a quality that they looked for. So you would suggest the CEO look for somebody who's smart, who's not afraid to express their opinion, has the courage of their convictions, and is looking at decisions from the point of view of the public. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Um, certainly excellent communication skills, particularly writing. I, I put great emphasis on the importance of good writing. Um, and uh, I think that... Um, uh, judgment is a quality that's hard to define, but is so critically important. Uh, people say you can't practice judgment, uh, but I tell kids in college that I speak to from time to time, you can improve your judgment. You can improve your attitude and your demeanor in meetings. Um, you know, I'm sure this has happened to you, Dick. Um, the chairman... Uh, 
would have been in the, com in the company of several people on your staff, and the next situation comes up and, and you're out of town and you say, I'm going to send so-and-so up to the meeting. And he'll say, maybe not. Why don't you send? Uh, and the person that he selects is usually one who he has confidence in and who fits into a senior executive discussion with an issue on the table. Mm -hmm. And... Um, People who know how to handle themselves in the, in, in the presence of other senior executives who are willing to hold their own and disagree or agree. I, uh, I hasten to add, you do not disagree for the sake of disagreeing. There has to be a fundamental reason why you would do that. But um, there are, you'd be surprised, or perhaps you wouldn't with all your experience, how many executives in a room would disagree but would be afraid to stand up to the chairman and say, hey, look, you're making a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I would not express my disagreement until the others left the room mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, diplomatic and otherwise. And so in those situations, you get up and close the door and you come back to him and say, look, um, the truth is, I think this is a lousy idea, and this is why. Now, he either buys it or he doesn't buy it. What if he doesn't buy it? Then I, 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 I accede to his good judgment in, in thinking that he knows the situation better than I. But frequently, it wouldn't be that he wouldn't buy it or not buy it right then. He would say, let me think about it. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a reason for his doing that, too. He doesn't want to uh, all of a sudden capitulate. Um, so the next day, uh, you would get together, and he would say, uh, you know, I thought about what you said, and I think, I think there's some merit to it. Did you ever have the impression the CEO was using you to get other people to defend their positions or oh, using you? Un to... unquestionably. How so? Could you tell us a little about that? Well, I'm talking about critical situations now where the company's reputation is at stake. It might be pulling a product off the market. It could be any, any number of serious things. And um, if he knew you had, and don't forget, in the interaction between the CEO, I, for years I held the title of assistant to the chairman. So as there was a closeness there, I was in and out of that office uh, maybe five or six times a day. Mm -hmm. And if he knew you had uh, strong feelings on a subject, he would get you to enumerate those while the, in the presence of others and then make them um, argue against it mm -hmm. while he sat back and uh, um, weighed what was said. Uh, a good chairman does a lot of listening. And he will make a judgment after all, the, the votes are in, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, it's, it's happened many times. And if you work with a person long enough, the first chairman I worked for, Philip Poffin, was the successor to Robert Wood Johnson, the legend at Johnson & Johnson. Hoffman called me into his office the first day he became chairman and said, from now on, you work for me. And... Um, uh, he went, was 12 years in the job and then passed me off to, um, and I say that in the kindest terms, I hope, <laughs> to uh, Dick Sellers. Uh, and I served uh, under Dick for three years and then 10 years under Jim Burke. Mm -hmm. Each of them I found to be extraordinary, talented, um, very um, decent and honorable people. Um, the highest level of integrity, and that's something that I would look for in working for a person with such loyalty, with as much loyalty as I hopefully brought to that job. How does somebody prepare to be the Larry Foster of a, of a company, senior PR counselor? Well, in terms of personal qualities, I think... Um, you have to do a lot of introspective thinking as to whether you feel you're capable of vying and competing 
not in the truest sense, but vying intellectually and um, uh, sometimes emotionally with a chairman. Um, you, if, if you have, you must have great respect for him or her, but in this case was him, as a leader. Um, if you're going to make a total commitment to a, a company and to a chairman and CEO, and you don't, you're not sure you like them, then do yourself a favor and get another job. Mm -hmm. Because over years, you become close. Um, there was never any doubt in my mind or in my chairman's mind as who was chairman um, and who was the public senior public relations officer. That, that line was never crossed. But you had um, a lot of interaction, a lot of interplay, a lot of debate. The relationship was tested many times. But it all begins with mutual respect. Could you give us an example of how the relationship might have been tested that we might learn from? Just let me preface that by saying Johnson & Johnson has a corporate credo that was written by Robert Wood Johnson in the early 1940s. It is very similar, markedly similar, to the Page Principles. And um, while he wrote that in the early 1940s, he outlined it for the first time in 1935 just at the time that Arthur Page was at AT&T. Mm -hmm. um, and Johnson uh, wrote um, uh, frequently in major magazines, and so did Arthur Page. And uh, the principles of the Page principles and of the Johnson & Johnson Credo, which is a one-page document that calls for four responsibilities, to the customer first, to the employees second, to the communities where we work and live, third, and fourthly to the stockholders. So um, they, are markedly, they are markedly similar. And uh, as an example, which you asked for, um, I remember one time we, were, we, we had to close down a major facility in the South. Um, and it went through all the routines of regular corporate evaluation where we, we we brought the legal people in, we brought the human resources people in, and we put together a package uh, that everyone in the company, in the senior management, thought was um, uh, fair and adequate. I disagree, because this was a textile mill in the South and a, really a textile town that we had created. It had an older population of employees. Uh, it was in a remote area that there, there weren't any other jobs. And um, I thought to cl close this down, even with a good package uh, compensation, was totally inconsistent with the Johnson & Johnson credo. And I vehemently argued that. And um, they, I created some doubts in their minds as to whether they were doing the right thing, including the chairman. Mm -hmm. And um, we left the meeting uh, with a situation undecided because no one knew what to do. Fortunately, one of the executive committee members at the, at the meeting was deeply involved in manufacturing. He knew, as you, as you probably know, Johnson & Johnson is a highly decentralized company. At that time, we had about 100 companies around the world, individually managed, cumulatively forming the, what, the substance of what Johnson & Johnson is at the corporate level. And he knew that one of the affiliates in the South, uh, in Texas, I believe it was, Southwest, was um, uh, going to add to a facility down there. And uh, it just so happened, after a lot of negotiations, a lot of working out details, that other affiliate company was able to go in and take over the facility of the textile business in that town. And as a result, uh, those people did not lose their jobs, and the town was saved. Um, if I had capitulated and not been stubborn, and I wasn't, I think I raised the subject, but when I did, I wasn't alone. Others did see, well, you know, he's, he's got a point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm going to switch gears here a little bit and talk right. about each of the page principles in turn, maybe not all six, but a few of them anyway. 
And I just like your, your comments and your thoughts and uh, what experiences come to your mind as, as uh, we discuss them. Let's start with to tell the truth. So basically fundamental that I, I you know, I, I, I can't add much to the, ter the three words tell the truth. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any other way. Um, I have, uh, uh, I learned through the years based on my press experience to how to, I think how to do a fairly credible job of handling the press. I never told them everything I knew. If I did, I wouldn't be needed in the job. Um, but I never lied, and they knew I would never lie to them. And they also knew I wasn't telling them everything I knew. And that's the name of the game. You know, you play that back and forth. So telling the truth is so fundamental that uh, uh, I, I couldn't work for a company that didn't tell the truth, and I don't think you could either. How do you decide what uh, of everything you know you have to tell them and what is acceptable to withhold? Well, in that case, uh, Dick, I'm, I'm thinking what's best for the business, and I'm thinking what's best for our customers, and I think what's best for our employees and our shareholders. So um, uh, I, I am not going to divulge things that will add to the magnitude of the story and maybe even distort it, but I'm going to respond to what I think the press should know at a given time, and, um, but not necessarily elaborate on it ad infinitum. I mean, that's not the role of a counselor. Um, there's a, an experience tells you a, a lot, teaches you a lot on, you know, when to, when to say that that's what I th think the company has to say at this time. Mm -hmm. Prove it with action. Is it as simple as actions speak louder than words? Well, if a company isn't taking actions on a problem, then they're derelict in their duty. Um, I don't think the question of action um, takes long to prove. I think every given situation, major situation, major crisis, it's a fluid situation. And you uh, constantly uh, are required to make decisions which are implemented into action. So I think a company that is reluctant or, uh, or hesitant about making, uh, a demonstrating action is derelict. And I think the media and public opinion, my interpretation of the media, my knowledge of the media and how the press would respond to a given situation has a great deal to do with how the public responds. Um, the, the public learns from the media, and then they make decisions. And I think that um, uh, you know what, what you feel you want the public to decide, hopefully in your favor, and therefore uh, the media is the conduit by which your, your judgments and your decisions. But that goes in, in hand in hand with action. I hardly think uh, the public would tolerate inaction on anything that is important. In fact, that's the greatest um, mistake, I think, that most people in handling crises make. The single greatest mistake. They lose track of the importance of timing. Mm -hmm. They wait two days to have meetings before they say they're sorry for what happened and they're going to correct it. I mean, you don't need two days. You may need 10 seconds, but you don't need two days. And uh, the timing is so critically important. And people just, and I think some of the crisis management people who come up with these great documents on how to handle crises, many of which uh, sometimes stay in the file gathering dust in the middle of a major, major crisis. But they forget that um, you have to, you have to, be, you have to demonstrate immediately what your intentions are and why, and that's not hard to do. You may not be able to get into detail, understand, but to, to give the company's fundamental position on any major situation doesn't take a lot of meetings. Listening to the customer. Well, that, it, and, and you have many customers. In the case of a company like Johnson & Johnson in the healthcare field, your customers include doctors and nurses and, 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 and the patient 
and it includes uh, hospital administrators, it includes the hierarchy of healthcare system, it includes government, includes FDA, and, and so forth. Uh, their audience, some are audience and some are customers, but um, it's terribly important to have uh, a knowledge of uh, or an instinct of what they, they are thinking and, and why they think they way, the way they do. They each have a reason for thinking the way they do. Um, and you have a lot of people uh, and a lot of sources that you can check. Mm -hmm. Uh, to make sure you're right. You're not always right. And you know, sometimes your own decisions, you're not infallible, and you're not that good that you don't make mistakes yourself. So in trying to be the loyal opposition, there will be times when you uh, went off the deep end and went too far and, and, and that you were wrong. So you regroup and come back and, and um, try to do better next time. But the, the, the major um, caveat is that you better be right more often than you're wrong, a lot more often than mm -hmm. you're wrong, mm -hmm. or you won't be around very long. Uh, managing for tomorrow, do you think that's something business has forgotten today? One of the most important ingredients uh, of any business is the thought of managing for the long term. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been caught up in managing other companies, have been, and people have been caught up in managing for the quarter and to satisfy the analysts on Wall Street. You must get some numbers out for right away. The truth is, any good business is, is planned for the long term and managed for the long term. And um, uh, Paige uh, used the word tomorrow, managing for t uh, tomorrow. And I, I understand that he didn't write it that way originally. But someone, and I don't know who to put the blame on, decided to change the word and inject tomorrow because they thought that that might be more meaningful or more expressive of what he meant. Um, I understand that the original words were much more indicative of building the business for the long term. When did you first hear about Arthur Page and the idea of an Arthur Page Society? Well, I first heard about it in um, the uh, mid-1980s from someone that I have great respect and admiration for and have for years, Ed Block. Mm -hmm. I heard about the Page Society, and I knew at that time it was made up of the communications executives of the Bell System mm -hmm. when the Bell System was one company. And um, about 1988, uh, Ed Block came to me and said, we think that the um, Page Society should be expanded nationally and include a lot of other senior executives from other companies. And um, I agree with him. I think that the, the quality that we saw and that was prevalent in the, in the Page Society at that time warranted a national level recognition and participation. And then he posed the question of whether I would agree to become the first non-Bell System president of the Page Society. And um, uh, I didn't take too long to say yes. In fact, I may have said it right away mm -hmm. because of my instincts that the Page Society uh, had the potential to be the finest professional society in the public relations field. Which it is today. What is it about Page, the Page Society, that you thought would make it different or, or necessary? I think uh, there were several things. One, um, the Page principles, which, in my view, held a a a, a very similar uh, um, response in my mind and my intellect to the, the Johnson and Johnson credo. Mm -hmm. I found something that I could really relate to. Um, uh, the other thing was that it was a time in this business, in the public relations business, um, in which this was needed. Um, it was a growing field. It was a more important field, but there, aren't, aren't any, there were not any major organizations out there 
that would give the kind of service and the kind of information and the kind of personal uh, uh, involvement um, that the Page Society could. And so therefore, it loomed to me as a very important uh, future step for public relations. And that's why I was eager to uh, take the presidency for two years. And my first job, when my mandate was to make this a national organization, I, first thing I did, I got a list of the top, com top companies in America, and I found out uh, who was running the public relations. And we went down the list and um, invited um, a, a, a large or a significant percentage of them to join the Page Society. And I don't think we had a single turndown. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had one, it might have been someone who was going to, knew he was going to be in transition on his job. But you have to remember, in those days, people weren't moving around as, as much as they are today. Mm -hmm. So membership in the Page Society became very important to people who well, were recognized as the, better, as the best people in the field. And um, that's why it, it has done so well. And today, unequivocally, there's no question that the Page Society uh, stands head and shoulders above any other uh, professional society in our field. Anything else about those early days of the Page Society that uh, interesting anecdotes, people involved? I think the, the important thing that I found at the beginning was that um, uh, because the Bell System had such a great reputation, uh, and because Ed Block and Jack Coton and others had such a great reputation, that uh, people were willing to become members. And they had already recruited some very important names like um, Harold Burson, whom I think is probably the, one of the finest counselors in the business. And when Burson uh, associates his name to something, um, that's a big plus. Mm -hmm. um, but you see, I, I think organizations are built in two ways, one people and one programs. You can't have one without the other. So we, try, we got some very, very outstanding speakers for our spring uh, conference and our annual meeting. Some of the best known CEOs in America and, and others in communications fields, some of the best journalists in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, uh, when you get that kind of a program, which aimed at being instructional and helpful to the things you do, and you have a, a, an audience of top-ranked people, um, that mix is, creates a wonderful chemistry for the growth of an organization. And the Paid Society has managed to build on that. And I'll forget, that's 10 years ago mm -hmm. when I finished the presidency. It has managed to build on it year after year, and um, uh, they have kept faith with the people who joined by offering quality programs. But always at the core of it are the page principles. And uh, you can't join the, the page society without knowing what they're about. They're about the page principles. And if you disagree with them or you have some hesitancy and some doubt about it, then, you know, Easiest solution is don't join. Right. Yeah. But we haven't had many turndowns. And there's another thing I'd like to mention about Arthur Page while I'm thinking about it. Why is, why is Arthur Page so important to us um, 75 years after his, uh, uh, his role in, at at and I think it's because Arthur Page took the time to express what perhaps others were thinking, including CEOs. Um, he was the one who put it on paper. He was the one that was willing to stand behind his words. And 75 years from now, we're doing television shows and, and writing books about Arthur Page. So I think the boldness and the intensity of his beliefs should be why we have reason to admire him. Um, he, uh, he took, he, he made the effort to do what perhaps others were thinking but didn't have the presence uh, of mind to do.